her story, which becomes a parable for our time in Ireland, about, about whether people or parties can be trusted to defend the impensable and to cover up what should be dragged into the light. Uh, we live in a time, or so I think, when Teflon and amnesia are the most valuable commodities for aspiring populists. The laws are irrelevant to us, don't stick to us, and it doesn't matter what horrors we've committed in the past. Let's move on and help memories of cruelty and play. But Maria Cahill continues to fight, as this book so richly demonstrates. She fights for memory and truth. Her book is about a world in which it's normal for a young woman to be spirited away in a car into a network of safe houses, upstairs rooms, of menacing meetings with men who have a well-deserved well reputation for violence, of interrogations and threats, and all because she dared to speak about the sexual violence she had suffered. This is an important, dark, and wonderful book. Um, before I close, I just want a personal note of thanks uh, to my collaborator, friend, Simon Hess, who had a uh, crucial role in the genesis of this book, uh, who has sold and done so much more than selling my books in Ireland for more years than I care to count. Um, and I want to thank Maria, above all, for putting up with my endless edits, my possible suggestions, and uh, our lawyers allergy you to risk. <laughs> uh, it's been a long road, but we've written a great book, and I'm so proud to publish it. Thank you. He said I need no introduction, so he didn't <laughs> introduce me. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was very honored when Maria asked me to launch this book, and I've spent the last two or three weeks buried in it, and um, every time I open it, it reveals something new to me, and that, for a journalist, is very important. But I just wanted to start by talking about Conor Coote O'Brien, who debated in 1971 with the then president of Sinn Féin, who I think at the time was Tomás Miguel. Um, but he was debating the idea that it was noble to volunteer to fight and die for Ireland. And O'Brien said he agreed. It was indeed noble in the earliest, strictest, meaning of that word, to belong to a military elite who decide who is to die and when, and who possess the prestige that power confers. These are nobles, aristocrats, samurai, no ordinary people, and they're subject to no common measure. Democracy, on the other hand, is not noble. Under democracy, civilians, not soldiers, have supreme power. Nobility, military elites, have no place in a democracy. And in parts of Northern Ireland during the Troubles, military elites ruled the roost. West Belfast was one such enclave where a military aristocracy decided almost everything. And the stories of what it was like to live there are only now emerging, what it was like to be young, or vulnerable or powerless in such places, or what it was to be a woman, because women are so often regarded as the spoils of war. What did a woman's rights or wishes matter when you set it against the needs of a warrior? What did the abuse of a woman matter when set against the needs of a warrior? or her reputation when set against the reputation of a warrior or indeed of his army. The aristocrats closed ranks just as the Catholic clergy closed ranks because hierarchies look after one another. And among the many scenes that are described so vividly, so vividly in this book is one which brings 
back again the sense of a hierarchical church, a cult, a court. And that was the public laying on of hands, the kiss, as Maria describes it, the Judas kiss, given in public to Maria very pointedly when she was being investigated by the IRA and given by both Jerry Adams and by Martin McGuinness. And you ask yourself, what was that embrace meant to mean? What was it saying? Was it saying, you belong to us, your access to justice, your rights, your voice, your silence, they all belong to us too. Was it a show of affection or was it a very public warning? Reading Anna Burns' Milkman and within the first few pages of Maria's book, I was being brought back to Milkman and I've since gone back again and read it. Um, I felt that I was seeing for the first time what it was like to be a member of that enclosed community, which was West Belfast. The sense that people did what the warriors wanted, served the warriors, there'd be no criticism of the warriors because that would be to undermine the cause. And after all, what were the wishes of individuals as against the great cause, the institution? And that strange world of Milkman was one where an 18-year-old girl she was stalked by a senior Republican gunman, was regarded by the other women as lucky, as a chosen one, even though the gunman in question had threatened to strangle her boyfriend, or as Anna Burns put it, her almost boyfriend. It was a closed world where, as Seamus Heaney said, whatever you say, you say nothing. And it was reinforced by a ban on the broadcast media in the Republic on interviews with the IRA or their political wing, Sinn Féin. The BBC, on the other hand, were allowed to interview Sinn Féin until 1988. And I remember working uh, for BBC Newsnight at the time in 1986 and doing a studio interview with Gerry Adams and realizing that this was the first time in nearly two decades of journalism that I had had a conversation with him on, on air. And so you had a sense of people inside West Belfast not being able to be listened to by anybody else and in turn not listening to anybody else. So the whole situation reinforced this enclosed feeling. And inside this closed community, this 16-year-old Murphy, Maria Cahill was caught like a spider in a web because no matter where she looked, where she turned, she saw danger. She saw danger to herself, to her family, danger to anybody who associated with her. She was the victim, but there's a heartbreaking picture here of a youngster trying to save everybody else up to the point where she thought the only way out was to commit suicide. <coughs> Because even though a ceasefire had been declared at the time this abuse happened, in 97, and when she was questioned by Republicans about her abuse in 99, killings were still happening. She was a teenager, but she knew very well that people could die, perhaps had died, for speaking up. And one of the more poignant moments in this book was her difficulty as a youngster in finding a, 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 a therapist, a counselor to whom she could talk when she was going through the trauma of having been abused, of, of not being believed. She, it took her a long time to find anybody that she could trust. Why? Because Republicans controlled everything, all the centers throughout West Belfast. And can you imagine that? Not to have anybody that you could safely talk to. And then there was the trauma of the abuse, the IRA investigation, followed by the long drawn out business of bringing it all to open court. And it went on for years. And it was made more and more difficult all the time for Maria to link the man in question to the IRA, something which was essential because it explained, and would explain in any court case, her fear of him and her initial reluctance to speak out. And a report by Sir Keir Starmer afterwards into how the matter was handled by the Public Prosecution Service declared that Maria Cahill and other young women who had complained of abuse had been failures by the authorities. Jim Allister of the traditional unionist voice of the former barrister 
and as he put it, there was a lack of official enthusiasm for the prosecution. And that was putting it mildly. And you had to ask, is this a matter of Maria and the two other young women who alleged abuse getting in the way of great events? Were they a political inconvenience? Power sharing in that government led by First Minister Peter Robinson and Deputy First Minister Martin McGuinness was still, if you remember, <laughs> shaky enough. Because only months before Maria decided in 2014 that her case had been so constrained by the Public Prosecution Service that it had no chance of succeeding. Only months before that, we had Gerry Adams standing outside the City Hall in Belfast, referring to the IRA with those famous words, they haven't gone away, you know. So that threat of violence, the fear of violence, of a resumption of violence, was always there. Political leaders were treading warily still, and in war, and in the aftermath of war, and in the hurry to find a peace, victims of injustice are often overlooked. We've seen it in Bosnia, we've seen it in Northern Ireland. It's salient that Maria, I think, chose for her title in, of this book, a line from Yeats's great poem, September 1919, referring to the, the rough beast, the Antichrist, which slouches towards Bethlehem to be born in the aftermath of the First World War. What rough beast slouches towards us now, I wonder. Finally, <coughs> Maria was braver than any of the forces that she was dealing with. She wasn't going to shut up. She went to the press, and she has now produced a book which will become one of those indispensable works on the history of the Troubles. A book that describes life in the closed republic of West Belfast like no other that I have read other than the novel that Anna Byrne wrote. A book that goes head to head with Republicans like no other because she knows the situation from the inside and because she has what must be so terrifying for opponents, a ferocious, and I use the word advisedly, a ferocious grasp of detail. My own daughter, My own daughter is only two years younger than Maria. So I suppose it was inevitable that Maria's parents and their reaction to this awful news that she had to tell them would have remained sharply in my mind. Maria's mother was a teacher with proper training in how to handle the issue of child abuse. And told not only that her child had been abused, but that she had subsequently been confronted with her abuser. Maria's mother exploded. God knows she raged the untold damage that you have done, my child. I mean, for any mother to have to take on board what had happened to her child and then the tr trauma of having had to go through it all again. What she describes in this book is some of the damage that was done to her. What she's asked the Republican movement for, including Sinn Féin, is not only an admission that she was abused, but an admission that the trauma was repeated when she was hauled in front of an IRA court to be confronted with her abuser. And therein lies the central and continuing re uh, question for the Republican movement and for Sinn Féin. To whom do they owe a duty of care? To the children who claimed they were abused, or to their own nobles, their own warrior hierarchy? It's with great respect that I launch Maria Kelly's <coughs> Rough Beast, my story. <laughs> my Look, um, a few things just before I get in. I wasn't. I, I don't normally write speeches, and somebody said it might be a good idea. I think they were afraid of me liveing with somebody. <laughs> but look, I mean, that's what kind of saved about 10 years ago. Um, 
Uh, before I talk about the book, that line, we haven't gone away, you know, Olivia, it sure wouldn't be me and I wouldn't be an upstart if I wouldn't say and I haven't gone away, you know, either. <laughs> and, um, and I think it's a difficulty um, for people and individuals that I haven't, but in many ways, you know, I look around at other people. I'm very grateful that Polly McGavin, for example, is here tonight. And I understand that the hurt and trauma for everybody involved um, will never go away either. And I think that's the most unfortunate thing about all of it. But thank you everybody for coming. I want to say, uh, before I talk about the book, I just want to thank Olivia for agreeing to launch it and also for your kind words this evening. Um, she is, I doubt, one of the few Irish journalists who get detail and also get human nature. And sometimes it's very hard to get both. And I think that everybody who's listened to Olivia's columns will, will understand that as a radio nerd, I've listened to everybody. Um, so it, it's a, a huge pleasure to have Olivia here to do it. And I have to also thank Joan Burton because Joan was the, the go-between, the interlocutor between myself and Olivia. And when she came back and said Olivia had agreed to launch it, I didn't quite believe her. So I then sent a text and said, are you sure you've agreed to launch this thing? <laughs> so, um, I think your column, Olivia, was an unrivaled piece of magic, actually, which was so successful because you see what ordinary people see at their level of close and personal and articulate those details through anecdotes and shrewd observations. And, and that's why it was a pleasure for me, not just to have you launch the book, but to also read the book and to listen to you there to get that detail, I think, is hugely important to me because it isn't just a story about abuse. It's, also, it's the story of my life and, you know, I, I shouted at Neil last week because he cut all the funny parts out of it. <laughs> there, there were funny parts in it, but then there are some that still remain. And I think that was important to me. The writing process was important that people actually felt that I had done an okay job with it. Um, look, a book like this is not going to win people votes in a climate where a prominent party is on the rise of the polls. People can be fickle, and this is not a book that will sit well with those who will not criticise a party heading towards the polls either. Sometimes it takes guts to put your head above the parapet before waiting to see what way the wind is blowing. Mm -hmm. And that is why I am so grateful to you, Olivia, for putting your head above the parapet. And to others like Ronnie Doyle, who was so gracious with his time and also providing the quote for the cover. I never thought I would see the day, but I am very moved and very grateful. Um, back then, in 2014, people like Regina Doherty put her head above it also, and she received dog's abuse for doing so. Sorry about that. Um, the SDLP's Atwood brothers and Mark Durkin, Mike Nesbitt, who I'm delighted I've just seen here, um, has travelled down, um, who at that point in time was the Ulster Unionist party leader. It's very difficult for party leaders um, to talk on this issue, and also people like Jim Allister, Fianna Foyle's Michal Martin, who was so decent um, with my case right back from 2012. Fine Gael's Enda Kenny, who sent a lovely um, WhatsApp message this morning from France, if you don't mind. And also <laughs> Francis Fitzgerald, who is in the EU, I think. All of you helped to lower that parapet further, and Joan, of course, also, um, so that it was easier for other people to put their heads above it, and the trench didn't heal in. Uh, think about that for a second. This was an issue of sexual abuse, which was covered up by arguably one of the most powerful institutions on this island, not just in my case, but in others like Poddy's, and the very many people who have come privately, who rightly, I think, um, thought twice about raising or waving their anonymity in that climate, that you waved your anonymity in. And I think in many ways, it was probably harder for you, Poddy, to do so when you saw the attacks sent in my direction. And I, I used this phrase in Belfast last week, and I do think it's very apt, and that's why I am so grateful that each and every one of you that are here tonight, everyone who will read the book, uh, you know, everyone who will buy the book, and also everybody who helped me way back then. Um, I think sometimes people check their politics before they check their morals, and that was very unfortunate, or should I say maybe sometimes people adjusted their moral compass to suit their politics. And I think when it was uncomfortable for people to raise the issue they did and when it became more uncomfortable for other people they checked around first and what I mean by that is like we all know that Sinn Féin are slowly moving towards a position where they very may or very well may be in government and that's democracy people vote for them their vote means as much as anybody else's on the street they're entitled to use it but I think sometimes for example 
I find, and there are some very good feminists, but there are also funded feminists out there, mindful of the Sinn Féin march towards power, who will over the next number of months trip over themselves to be photographed with people like Mary Lou Macdonald. That'd be very uncomfortable for some people to hear, but I've never kind of gone with the grain on things. And I think that people, what I mean by that, people do check their politics first before they check their morals, and that should never have been the case on an issue of child abuse. It just shouldn't have been. Um, I think it, it takes a spectacular act of mental contortion. If you read this book from A to Z, do not get the issue. Um, and the issue at its very core was someone, me, who was vulnerable, 16 years of age, abused, very simple, and then re-abused by an entity which called itself the IRA, and re-abused further than when I went in the public domain. And all of them have had an impact, not just on me, but also on my family members, who I'm glad to say are here tonight. So I think if you ignore that, or if you can set it aside in terms of pushing your support for someone that is actually, to me, that's called hypocrisy. Back in 1997, people in West Belfast didn't put their heads above the parapet either. Um, the chance of getting shot was increasingly diminishing, but falling foul of the community meant arrow slings and rumour mills and painful isolation. The cult of community in West Belfast can be both intoxicating and insidious, exciting and dangerous. All elements which, when combined, was a recipe for disaster for a vulnerable young girl whose Republican radicalisation, easy for me to say, was deep in her DNA. Ripe fruit for a man who got his kicks out of shooting young people in the knees, yet then urinating on them afterwards, and also in sexually abusing people. And I think that sexual abuse is a disgusting breach of the human psyche and an appalling act of entitlement on another. We need to do better at lifting it out of the literal shadows and we also need to do better at attempting to not just treat the victim but also the perpetrators. Um, something else which I tried to convey in the book was the paramilitaries are people too. Yes, they have done some despicable, awful, inhumane things but there's nothing wrong with trying to understand people and their motivations and explanations. What is wrong is accepting the justification. Uya of the Ra is hurtful to the many Northern Irish victims. It is hurtful to the unionist community. And it isn't simply a harmless chant. It's something which, no matter what the reason for being sung, sung strikes to the core and hurts those who are nursing broken hearts and fractured minds at home, trying to heal. And we need to do better. Um, everyone knows that I come from a Republican family. So, you know, a family who I still love, despite everything. You can't be responsible for your elders and nor they you and I'd be pretty confident they wouldn't want to be responsible for me at this moment in time. But I've never shied away from the issue. You know, when I talk in the book about my relationship with Joe, for example, I wish I had had more time to talk about my relationship with my grandparents because they were actually and still are very important to me. Um, so everyone will know that connection in terms of my father's side of the family, Republicanism, which goes way back to the Fenian movement and the IRB. Um, I've tried to explain how even though people can be involved in awful events, they're still human beings and have loving relationships with all the complexities that that brings. No one will be familiar with my other relative, my great great uncle Clyde, Clyde, Captain Clyde Kirkwood Weldon, a decorated British Army officer who fought at Ladysmith and in Russia and who invaded parts of India. He also funded the UVF Limbs Hospital and likely smuggled arms into Northern Ireland. He was also a Freemason and a member of the Orange Order. And so I hold the unique distinction, probably, of having one relative who armed loyalism and another who brought weapons back from Gaddafi, the armed Republicans. I mention this to illustrate the eclectic nature of Northern Ireland and how, if we throw a stone back in time to ripple through history, all of us have an interesting backstory. I'm glad to have all of that in mind. Um, it certainly makes for interesting conversation around the dinner table. But what it also does is it allows me to move between the Republican and Loyalist communities and find common ground, and I wish that more people did so. I think that um, the understanding that Olivia articulated so well in her journalism, for example, an understanding that came from working in Belfast, is lacking sometimes in the narrative that is being spun nowadays down here. Sometimes it takes someone to lift their head above the parapet and open a window to shine a chink of light into the shadows both of sexual abuse and of abuse of power. And I hope that in reading it you understand what I have been trying to do with it. Because I sought to convey a dark period of my history, but also to show that everyone has the capacity to change. I've also, I hope, illustrated how someone's life need, need not be written off 
And that was very important to me to do. Your life doesn't need to be written off by events which dictate um, your path in the first part of it. And how, even in an abnormal envir environment, people's lives can continue in what is their ordinary. I also hope that in reading, you think the writing wasn't too shabby, um, <laughs> because that does mean a lot to me. It's the one thing I have always been interested in. I had some very good English teachers at school. Um, I had some very good politics teachers too who taught me how to argue. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> not sure if any, many people who've been at the wrong end of it will appreciate it as much. I couldn't, well, Neil, Neil felt in my editor, who I saw a minute ago, that he disappeared on me. He's around somewhere. He, there he is. Neil, as he said, had asked me to write a very different book. He wanted me to write a political analysis book of, of Sinn Féin and what that would look like when they were moving towards power. And, you know, I started out, probably was about 80,000 words in. Um, and, you know, that's <laughs> the, length, the length of a book. So I probably could have written it and people maybe would have bought it and they probably would have read it, but I wouldn't have been true to myself in terms of doing it. And I knew that if there was going to be anything that would actually explain how people can abuse power or how you think they will behave when in power, there is no better way of doing that for me than to explain how when the most fun you're faced with the most vulnerable, how you treat them, I think that's a huge test of character, not just for a political party, but also individuals. Um, I found the writing easier than reading back over it because I think I had removed myself writing it and then it jolted me back to reality um, when I had to read the proof. And I hope never to have to read it again, but I hope that you all do. Um, and then I hope you'll tell your friends to read it too because I do think, and this is not an ego thing, but I, I think there is always um, an importance, uh, like God knows we all do have an ego, but I, I think I wanted people to know what happened. That was important for me, that people knew what had happened. There was so much thrown around in the public domain, so many details that were thrown out that people got lost in the melee of it at times, and I think this goes from A to Z. Um, but I, I have a few thank yous. So, first of all, there's a woman here tonight, I can't see her, but I know she's here because I saw her earlier on, Jennifer O'Leary, who's actually written her own book, a fantastic book called The Padre, uh, recently is here tonight. Um, Jennifer was the journalist who I waved anonymity to on the, the BBC Spotlight programme. She's also the journalist that Paddy McGahan waved his anonymity with also. And we trusted her because she was, um, she treated us well, and so did her team. And she has continued to treat me well, and I'm proud to call her a friend. So I, I really have to thank Jennifer, because the story wouldn't have had the impact that it did without that programme. Um, I want to thank Michal Martin and Mike Nesbitt and all of the other politicians, like I can see Joan and Breton and Ivana. I can't see everybody, so please forgive me if I've left you out. But, left you out, but you know, I sat with Hall in 2012, I think, and I recounted the story um, to him. And I, like, I don't want to get upset about it, but it was a very difficult place to be at that point in time. You know, you're going into the Doyle, a place you've never been in before. You're sitting down and you're trying to recount your story. And you, at that point, I had no way of knowing what was going to happen with the court cases. So I was two years into a case that eventually collapsed after year four. Um, and, and it's important also to say that people were found not guilty, they denied it. So actually the very fact that this story, or my experiences and the story made its way into the public domain was phenomenal because it's very, very difficult to name anybody, um, particularly abusers when a not guilty verdict is handed down. We were able to do that because people put their heads above the parapet, not only within the BBC, but also every single politician who I went to for help, who helped me. And I think sometimes politicians get the rough end of the stick and the word decent is in this book quite a few times. If there was one person who was very, very decent to me, it was Michal Martin, and also Mike Nesbitt, and Joan, and Ben. <laughs> and then I forgot about Enda, and Regina, and Francis, and everybody else. So also to thank Declan and Simon from Gil Hess, and Catherine Caldwell from Head of Zeus, um, who've had to suffer around Robin emails for weeks from me as I tried to step across detail. I didn't have an agent when writing this book, so I, I think they probably wish that I had it done because I was across the Aiding Blackwood also. I should have thanked you. Aiding worked with me in the Senate, and she knows that I'm like a new real star fan. So um, you really helped me to get the book out there, and I appreciate it. Um, to Breach and Stephen Quinn, who aren't here tonight, I just wanted to say a word about Breach, who phoned me um, the other day. The reason that I'm saying it is because I know there's a platform here with a microphone and there are people who can help that family and I really hope that they do so. Breach is in the hospital at the minute, she's unwell, and Stephen was in the hospital last week, so they've had a terrible, terrible time as a family unit and she really wanted to be here tonight. So 
I am I'm just extending everybody's best wishes to her, to Polly and Renata, and also their daughter Hannah. Thank you for using your voice, also, and for supporting Polly and Dana because I know that there is stress on the family unit. To all of the politicians and journalists, thank you. Some of you are in the book. All of you stay with me. Ursula Halligan and Nile O'Connor in particular feature in the book. Um, both pursued the story with a dogged determination and a fairness to all concerned without losing the very basic human empathy, which was important at the time to experience. Um, Anne Harris gave me my first byline, and I'm so glad that she did. Uh, she also gives great hugs. Uh, Willie Keeley continued with that tradition, and Jodie Cork and Nolan English continued from time to time. And it allows me to put my thoughts on paper, but that's never taken for granted. Um, I can't rattle off a list of every journalist everybody wants to get home, or at least have a glass of wine, but rest assured it is always appreciated um, to me, felt in my editor. You definitely got more than you bargained for with this book, but you took a decision to raise your head above the parapet also. And, you know, even with the testy lawyers who want us to remove the words IRA from the book, you know, we managed to get there at the end. I mean, I remember going back to Neil at one point and saying, it doesn't really have the same ring to it. You know, I went and met with the Republican Council. It doesn't have the same <laughs> import as the IRA Army Council, does it? Um, the poet Maya Angelou once wrote, there's no greater agony than burying an untold story inside you, and this is true, and I rectified that, I think. Thank you all for helping me to tell it, but Neil had the agony of editing that untold story and dealing with someone who is fastidious with detail and who knows her own mind. Uh, so you were very gracious about it, and I'm proud to call him my editor, and hopefully also now my friend. Thanks also, there's a, a, a woman who's just a few years older than me, but she killed me for saying it, who... I grew up with in primary school in West Belfast, um, who I think has shown nerves of steel actually in terms of her support of me. Her name is Julie, she's here tonight. She comes from a Republican family also, but she has never shied away from providing support and friendship to me, and she still lives there, and I think that's very difficult sometimes for people to do, and she doesn't give a shit. <laughs> so that's really good. Um, my last thanks. Uh, go to, and I, I wonder would someone go and get her for me, because she's disappeared. Um, if someone knows where Sarah is, do you have any idea? Uh, Down the back, is she? Is Sarah there? Um, just before I get on to Sarah, my last thanks. Huh? She's, she's there somewhere. She'd take her time making an entrance, typical. <laughs> um, my last thanks really go to my father and mother. My mother couldn't be here tonight because she agreed to take my niece to ballet lessons. She's five and is a handful, so... Um, she is absolutely raging that she missed out on Rory being here tonight, so we'll send her um, our food rations up. Um, but my mother and father had a really, really rough time with this. You know, they had the IRA in their living room, and I think that is probably one of the most upsetting things for me. And I spoke about this last week. It was actually being brought into the living room by the IRA without any choice, and watching the hurt on my father's face in the living room in particular, and then, of course, my mother who flew across the room, but... My father was in my eye line, he was standing up um, in the living room and that, that, that I never want to see anything like that again. And I hope that no one else experiences anything like that again. But also I think when you then have to cut yourself off from the wider family unit, it is a very, very horrible place to be in. And that was a necessity because obviously, you know, we are a Republican family and some people put their politics before, unfortunately, the family relationship. Um, has Sarah materialised or is she, she's just going to hide, is she? No? Well, look, sure, we thank, there she is, like she's finally coming around the corner. Come on before I start singing. I've heard my name, I didn't know what was happening. Normally when you hear your name, it's a sign that somebody's looking for you. <laughs> this is Sarah. So Sarah, um, it wasn't appropriate to have you. Sierra is the kindest DB and she really is. Like she's 13. She killed me for doing it because I made everybody last week sing happy birthday to her. I'm not gonna do that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it was bad enough last week. But she really is the life of my life. And like her whole life has spanned this. I was pregnant when I made my police complaint with her. Um and she, despite all the odds, came out and she is a very rounded, 
kid, you know, so I just wanted to say thank you because if it wasn't for Sarah, I wouldn't be able to travel up and down and go to all these places because she, she actually doesn't give off most of the time to them. <laughs> she is lovely and kind, but she's also more stubborn than I am. Um, just one other thing on my father. I was sitting at dinner last week and he left um, to get the bus. And Neil, who's my editor, hope you don't mind me breaking this confidence, but he leaned in and just said, what a lovely man. And he is, he's a lovely man. So if you get an opportunity, please shake his hand tonight. Just that one more thing then before I go. Um, if you do have a glass, raise it. I think there is hope, despite the all. I mean, I hear people saying, you know, this is horrendous and, and all of the rest of it. I'm still here and I'm still alive and still standing. I think that actually getting the book written has been a good achievement for me and a good lesson. Well done. Thank you.